Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming today. And thank you, Vulcan, for having us. You guys uh, always have a great reason or a great area for us to do a luncheon. Um, I would like to thank all of our sponsors also. So if I could have all of you guys who are sponsors stand up, please. All right. I love Ken. I love Ken. Thank you. And we are streaming live, so behave yourself. Um, thanks so much for coming today, and I'm going to hand this over to Carmen. We have a great presentation for us, and uh, thank you very much, Satterberg, for coming today. And Carmen, here you go. Okay. So Dan Satterberg has served in the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office for more than three decades and was first elected to lead the office in November of 2007. Dan is committed to improving public safety and the reform of the criminal justice system through partnership with the communities most impacted by crime. Dan also believes that we believe that we need to do more to help people leaving prison make a successful transition. And he's committed to reducing recidivism among people leaving jail and prison as the best strategy to improve public safety and reduce the cost of incarceration. Dan was born and raised in South King County and attended Highline High School. His father was a lawyer in White Center and his mother was a nursing instructor um, in Highline Community College. He graduated from the UW Undergraduate School, Political Science and Journalism, and the UW Law School. He also plays bass and sings in the classic rock cover band. <laughs> Interesting fact. So dramatic pause as we welcome him to the stage. And okay, thank, you. thank you, Carmen. Because I played a rock band, I couldn't get really close. I may not need this. Uh, we're peeking out. Okay, we tried to improve the uh, screen, and then I think we unplugged something, so we'll just take a minute. I want to first say uh, how glad I am to be here at the John Wilkins Academy. I had a chance about two months ago to come and check this place out. I had never, I didn't know what it was, but I'm very interested in anything that we can do as a community to help people recover from substance use disorder, from drug addiction. And what I found here was really a unique approach. Uh, it's a residential program, yet you probably know all about it, but I've, I learned that, that the young men who come here can live here for two years. It's extremely affordable, $5,000 to get you two years of residential time here. It's a therapeutic community, which there's plenty of evidence to suggest that a therapeutic community, which really just means people who are all experiencing the same the same challenge, that they live together, that they strengthen each other, uh, that they support each other through the difficult times. And it also has this uh, extraordinary work opportunity. So the store below us is, a, I think, a, a moving company and a landscape company. And, and those of you who study this know that there's also real therapeutic value to work because part of the, of the challenge in dealing with people who have lost their way to a drug addiction is to restore their confidence is to make a connection to prove that they are worthy of being helped and uh, there's nothing like the, the confidence that having a job working with other people being part of a team accomplishing a goal, all of that is uh, is very important to the recovery process. So uh, this is a tremendous asset for the Kent community and for King County, and I was very glad to find out about this. Uh, while we're struggling to get plugged in, and thank you, uh, Cameron, for coming in with the new the new projector. I want to introduce Carla Lee here, who's my deputy chief of staff, who's frantically trying to get the evening stuff together. Uh, uh, I never, I never leave a home without Carla because then there's somebody who can do this and I don't have to worry about it. Uh, let me talk just a moment about the King County Prosecutor's Office because you may not know about us. We are uh, the second largest public law office in the state, 250 attorneys and 250 staff. We have both a criminal function, which you might be more familiar with, but we're also the civil attorneys for King County. So we are corporate counsel to everything that King County is doing the 14,000 county employees, including the metro system, the service water management, the, the jail and the sheriff and the executive and the council and everything that the county does, we are part of, including today, uh, there's the flood 
district and the responses on the, from the roads department and the emergency department, all of that is a county function and, and the attorneys in my office provide support for every part of that. We also have in the criminal division uh, about 170 attorneys who uh, are part of uh, felony prosecution. So the, the criminal jurisdiction for my office is any felony committed in the county, any juvenile offense committed in the county, and then misdemeanors that are committed outside of city limits. So all told, we, we file uh, about 7,000 felony cases a year, uh, another four to 5,000 misdemeanors, and about 1,500 juvenile cases. So we are a very busy office uh, handling uh, some of the most serious crimes that happen in our county. This is so exciting to watch this. <laughs> You know also that we have uh, just a couple miles uh, to the west here, the Regional Justice Center in Kent. I have a large office there. Uh, today we've got about six uh, jury trials going on right now, everything from homicides to child sexual assault to aggravated assault. Uh, and uh, we have two uh, drug delivery cases being prosecuted there uh, today as well. So we do everything from the homicides uh, to uh, property crimes and drug crimes. See, we were so close and then we moved the table six inches that way and lost it all. Okay, we're getting it. So the title of this presentation, when you begin to see it, is uh, called Criminal justice, community justice. And as Carmen mentioned, I've been a prosecutor now for 35 years. And over the time, I've, I realized that we are most effective when we work together with the community that we serve. And that I also realized that there's a lot of areas where the community has better answers than the court does. Uh, and one of the things that I want to talk about today is a, is a community-wide approach to drug crimes. because. That's something that obviously has become a huge issue for every community in America, and certainly South King County has been impacted uh, by drug abuse, drug sales, and, and, the, and the associated crimes that occur uh, for people who have a daily need to find drugs. When I was started out in the office in 1985 was the, the first appearance of crack cocaine. About 1987, it really hit town. It was a new drug. It was frightening to a lot of people. We heard about crack babies. We heard, saw a lot of violence associated with it. Gang violence. Gangs came up from Los Angeles to help sell drugs here in the Northwest. And, and as a result of that, uh, the legislature in 1989 passed some uh, extraordinarily tough laws against selling drugs. In fact, if you sold five dollars worth of heroin or cocaine or methamphetamine, the law in our state required you to go to prison for two years. And if you did it again, it would be a four-year sentence and a six-year sentence. And I'll tell you, I'll show you what happened uh, in response to that and where we are uh, in the state of Washington right now. That looks great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Let's give a big round of applause. <laughs> We won't be able to zoom it like we were trying to accomplish. So oh, you guys just, just like right there. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's, not, let's, not, let's not get greedy. That's perfect. Thank you. And Carla is my clicker. Pull up a seat. You get comfortable. But I, when I do this, I said, we usually have a little remote clicker, and for some reason that doesn't work today. So when I. I have a lot of practice doing this from my couch at home, so when I do this, <laughs> let's go to the next slide. Thank you. So criminal justice, community justice, because I think the answers to all of our most vexing problems are, are also found here in the community and in partnerships with the community. So I have to always start when people say, well, why, why do we talk about criminal justice reform? What's wrong with our criminal justice system? And and then I think understanding a history of what is commonly called mass incarceration is really important to, to begin that conversation. We know right now that the United States is the world's leader in incarceration. We have 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisons. Between the federal system, the state system, and local jails. But it wasn't always that way. In fact, this chart will show you that the US incarceration rate until mid-70s was about 100 people for every 100,000 residents. 
That today is the rate in Europe and in most of the countries that we consider developed countries. It's about 100 people per 100,000 residents. But then something happened starting in the 70s, the 80s, and with a lot of uh, enthusiasm in the 90s where we actually increased our incarceration rate to 500 people per 100. So go from 100 to 500. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but drug crimes was the primary driver of that escalation. And incarceration continued to rise even after crime fell. Now this chart will show you, this the golden line is the incarceration rate. And it, it peaked, the violent crime rate is the dark blue rate. And it peaked in about 1993, after we started building. But even after it fell, and it continues to fall today, we continue to build and fill prisons. What you don't hear a lot on the news, because news is really good about telling you what happened yesterday, but not telling you what's happened for the last four decades, is that the crime rate in America has, re has fallen to where it was in the mid-1960s. And the crime rate and the felony rate in Washington state is down 40% since 1980. But if we were to go back to the incarceration rate of the mid-1960s, we would have to release 80% of the people who are today behind bars in America. So we, we have this phenomenon, and it is fairly recent, and it wasn't always this way. And so the question is, is this something that we want to sustain, or is there, are there some strategies to begin to reduce this while not impacting community safety. Washington State has the same story. So over here in the first bar, 1990, we had 6,000 people in state prison. By the end of that decade, we tripled our prison capacity to 18,000. And it continues, it continued to grow very slowly because we didn't build any more prisons after that. We filled in around the edges and certain footprints within the penitentiary uh, grounds, but we haven't built a new prison. And one of the things that Washington State has to face is this dilemma. We do not incarcerate people at the national average. In fact, we're almost around half of what the national average is. Yet, our prisons today are 100% full or more. In fact, the women's capacity is about 105% capacity right now. For a while, they were using the Yakima County Jail to put female prisoners, which was terrible. It's not set up for long-term stay at all, but the, the, the state is facing the shortage of beds. And so we're either gonna have to build another prison, which will cost at least $250 million and take about six years from the day you decide to do it, and $80 million a year to staff it, that'll be a 1,400-bed facility. That's what we're going to need to do unless we find out some other way to reduce our prison capacity uh, and, and, the, and the, the need for prison. So here's, here's the, what I was talking about before. The national average, close to 500 people, uh, the rate of imprisonment per 100,000 residents in, in Washington State is 269, Oregon 361, California where everything you could think of could go wrong and the prison system has gone wrong, they're not even worth the national average is. The national average is being boosted by, well, number one now. Anybody know what the number one incarcerated state in America is? It used to be Louisiana. Oklahoma. 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 Yeah. And so a lot of the states are waking up that to an unsustainable uh, situation right now and asking, well, what can we do? What, what should we do about it? And so they're starting to review and it's starting to become a bipartisan issue because this is unaffordable for everybody, for all states, and it is not effective for things like people who have a drug problem. We also have to talk uh, about the racial disproportionality in the criminal justice system. This is an undeniable mathematical fact that here in the state of Washington, where 4% of our residents are African American, that 18% of our prison inmates are African American. There are lots of complicated reasons why that is. It's related certainly to historical and institutional racism and to poverty and the chaos that can come with poverty and, and disruption. It can also be fed by generational incarceration, young people growing up with parents who are in prison, is one of the primary adverse childhood experiences for those of you who know the ACEs scores, that's one of them. So a lot of this sort of feeds off on itself. But this is one, this is an area where we should always think about when we're talking about criminal justice reform, will it help reduce this disparity? Because this is one of the things that affects the legitimacy of our laws within the communities that are most impacted by crime. And we know that now when, when police respond to a violent crime in a, in a community of color and 
while we expect that the people might have seen what did happen, there are no witnesses who are coming forward. They're not responding to a summons to come in and testify. And the boycott of our system of laws, I think, is due in part to the to this kind of statistic and the feeling that the criminal justice system has not given a fair shake to people of color. So that has got to be one of our motivations. Here in Washington State, African American men are six times more likely to go to prison than white men. These are undeniable mathematical facts. So who's in prison in Washington State? Well, see, I think we make pretty good decisions about who goes there. About 70% of prison inmates, and there, as you saw, there are about 18,000 or so people today sitting behind bars in a state prison. I'm not talking about jail. Just so you remember, jail is for where people stay for a sentence of up to a year or where there most of two-thirds of the people in the King County Jail are awaiting a felony trial. Prisons where you go for a sentence that's more than a year. So 70% of the people in the state prison system are there for violent crimes. Uh, and 17% are there for property crimes. In our state, under our state sentencing law, to, to go to prison for a property crime means you usually have at least five priors before, things like car theft, burglary, those things. Uh, you have to have a significant number of priors in order to score into a prison range. Uh, and, and this I want to talk about too, drug crimes. There was a time in our state where 26% of state inmates, one in four, were there for a drug crime. Today it's 7%. We have done some things over the decades to realize that while prison may be a, a proper thing for people who are selling lots of drugs to make lots of money for non-addicted profiteers uh, and for people who are importing large amounts. It is not a place that helps people who have a drug addiction and it's not a place where people who are merely arrested for possession should find themselves because it doesn't have any apparatus to help people recover. There's nothing like the John Vulcan experience within the state prison. One of the things that we have to do if we're not going to build that next prison is we have to admit that we have a recidivism problem. 8,000 people will be released from prison this year. You know, the average prison sentence is only two years. 8,000 people are gonna be released this year and one out of three of them are gonna be back in prison in just three years. And so you have to ask, well, why, why is that? Is it because they're just really bad people or, and or, maybe it's, maybe it's both, uh, have we set up so many barriers to people who have felony convictions that they can't find a place to live? They can't get a job. They can't get a student loan. They can't live in public housing. Doors are slammed for them. So uh, I think it was mentioned in the introduction, I'm uh, co-chair of the statewide re-entry council. We were created by the legislature and the governor to come back and really be the conscience of the legislature and say, don't forget we have this issue. And if you don't want to build that next prison, Let's invest instead in the kinds of support, stabilizing support that everybody needs when they get out of prison, that everybody needs, and all of us need to succeed. You've got to have a place to live. You've got to have a source of income. You have to have some hope in your life, some education or a job. And you may need even more. You may need some therapeutic help to, to avoid uh, falling back into a, a drug addiction or into a behavioral health uh, crisis. But right now, we're not doing enough uh, for, for people who are getting out, and what happens, it's, a, it's a direct, obviously a direct line to public safety. Higher recidivism means more crime. Lower recidivism means lower crime. And since nobody wants to build that next prison, uh, we should take some of the money that would otherwise be dedicated to that construction and instead invest it in community-based nonprofits that can help people. And there's evidence to suggest that even if, if that the best way to do it is to have community nonprofits uh, have, have people make a connection with the individual inmates while they're still incarcerated. Come up with a re-entry plan. Where are you gonna live? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do with your time? Who's gonna be your support system? And then meet them at the gate on the day that they're released and begin to implement that plan. The evidence suggests that that first day is critical. They find themselves wandering through a strange city with, with nothing. And, and by the way, the, the today the state's re-entry package that, that is presumptively given to every inmate is $40, clean clothes, uh, and a bus ticket back to the county where you were convicted, whether you want to go there or not. So that's our standard re-entry plan. And so I guess it's not really a surprise that that doesn't work very well. So we need to do better, and that's what we're, we're trying to do with the legislature. Now I'll say, 
that there's still a lot of resistance to people, uh, in particularly political resistance, and some legislators who were elected on tough on crime uh, mm -hmm. platforms or don't want to be seen as being supportive or nice or coddling criminals. But that's really antiquated thinking. In fact, we're all in this boat together. We're all either going to have to keep building and filling prisons, or we're going to have to start treating the whole concept of punishment. We have to decide what we want to do with punishment. To me, punishment should be one and done. We send you to prison at one time. You're going to learn your lesson. You're going to develop some skills. You're going to identify what your own internal trauma is, what your own internal motivations and aspirations are. And when you get out, we're going to help support you so that you don't come back. And maybe it's places like this that have a residential component, have a therapeutic component. You live with other people who are going through difficult times, and you support each other, and you have work. Those kinds of things are the models that are successful. 40 bucks in a bus ticket, I'm pretty sure that it's never been proven to be successful. So drugs. I'm not here to offer you a solution to the drug problem because nobody has a solution. What we have instead are a series of strategies that we can decide to adopt and fund and lean into and hope that they work. Because we human beings have been using mind-altering and mood-altering substances since the dawn of time. People, and the reality is people are going to use drugs whether we want them to or not. So the question is, how are we, as the community that suffers the collateral consequences and the, and, the, and the crime that's associated with it and the chaos and the child neglect and all of the things, the bad things that happen with substance use disorder collaterally, it's our responsibility to figure out how are we going to help manage this in a better way. I think today we have we're not managing. Because we people sometimes, you know, the, we have this tremendous homeless uh, situation here, very obvious homelessness on the West Coast and in Seattle and, and certainly in King, in Kent, in King County. Last year, uh, <coughs> in the over, overdose statistics that were uh, reported by the King County Medical Examiner, we know that the homeless population in, in King County is far less than 1% of the population, but they represented 16% of the fatal overdose deaths. So we know that with the despair and poverty and, and, and degradation that comes with being homeless comes also an attraction to drugs. And which came first, the drugs or the despair? I don't know. I think they're all wrapped up in the neurochemistry of, of, of every human being. But we know that it, that it definitely falls uh, hard on that. But the, the other thing that I saw in those statistics that the number one cohort for fatal overdoses last year in King County were men 50 to 59. My, my brothers, who are also the most at risk of suicide, uh, are also the most at risk of fatal overdoses. We had 418 people die from drug overdoses last year, but it's important to also know that, that drug overdoses are not always fatal. In fact, there are many, many more times non-fatal drug overdoses that, are, that our EMS system deals with, that our emergency rooms deal with. And on average, in King County hospitals and King County EMS, they report about 400 non-fatal overdose situations every month. And I said there are about 400 deaths, so this fourth is 12 times as many non-fatals. But it has a tremendous impact on human beings and on families and on certainly on the uh, medical system that we all are part of. So what should we do? First of all, we need to recognize what's happened in our community. We went in our these are national statistics of overdose deaths from opioids. So remember, people the over, overdose deaths are also attributed to stimulants. So methamphetamine and cocaine are, are another um, leading cause of overdose deaths. Uh, and, and alcohol is always uh, somewhere in the background as well. Uh, in about 20% of the fatal overdoses, alcohol was present. Uh, with other drugs last year. But we, we have seen in our country the spike from about 8,000 deaths in 1999 to 72,000 uh, in, in 2017, and it continues to climb. I think those numbers are a little hard to, hard to come up with nationwide, but we know it's a massive, massive problem and it has gone up uh, tremendously. And I mentioned in, in King County some of the drug trends that we are seeing. We're seeing opioid uh, <coughs> deaths on the rise. We're seeing um, 211 that were from, let's go back there. So 211 from opioids, but we had another 200 plus from stimulants, methamphetamine and, and cocaine particularly. Uh, we continue to set records every year. And this is the new drug that 
everyone is concerned about for good reason. So fentanyl is a synthetic opioid made uh, primarily in labs in China, sent to Mexico, and then comes from Mexico up into the United States. Some parts of the United States have had fentanyl for a very long time because their heroin traditionally came in a powdered form from Asia. And so it, would be, it was easy to mix fentanyl with powdered heroin. Our heroin has traditionally come from the west coast of Mexico and it's black tar. It's this gooey substance, so it's, you can't really mix anything with it uh, easily. We've had in some places in the in back east, in Massachusetts, for instance, in Maine, over 80% of their overdose deaths are due to fentanyl. Ours are just now starting to show up, and they're starting to show up in, in pretty uh, frightening ways. I want to say this about fentanyl. It is, uh, it's, it's newly emerged, but there's no reason to think it isn't our new normal because of this. You can buy on the internet, somewhere on the deep web, if you know what you're doing, you can buy a kilo of fentanyl from China for about $15,000, and it'll show up and it's about the size of a book. You can take that, if you don't care about the human misery, and if you're all about profit, you can, and you, they, what they do, and I saw this up in Vancouver, which has been slammed with fentanyl for many years, they chop it up with powdered caffeine or other inert substances, and they sell it for $15 for a flat. $15 would fill a syringe and get somebody hot. You can take that $15,000 investment and make two to three million dollars <laughs> off it by chopping it up and selling it on the street. So the profit motive is huge. No longer have to worry about opium fields and poppies and farmers and all of that eradication thing because these are made in, in, in uh, places that we'll never know in China, shipped over in huge, in, as a tiny little box in an enormous container ship. Uh, through Mexico, and so the the interdiction of it. Once in a while, you'll find you'll see someone will get a couple kilos of fentanyl. It's a big deal, and it's a good deal. And the people, if we catch them with it, they go to prison for a long time. Usually, the, the feds will take that case. But we know that it's just a very the tip of the iceberg. And what's most concerning about fentanyl right now, obviously, we've seen these, these death is is that it's it's being pressed into counterfeit <coughs> oxycodone pills uh, and Percocets and other things that look like legitimate pharmaceutical opioids. And we've had a, in 2019 a, a number of high school students, I think five that, that I know about, uh, who took a pill that they thought was a legitimate pharmaceutical opioid, maybe one they didn't have a prescription from, but it looked like one they'd taken before and didn't die from it instead it was fentanyl with a little tinge of blue in it, pressed in, uh, in pill presses in Mexico and sent up here. And if you have one grain too much, you die right there. It's, a, it's, a, it's almost an instant poison. And so we've had, so this is what they look like, the counterfeit pills. If, and, and I guess the, the message we need to get out to our kids is that if, if you don't know where the pill came from, it probably is fentanyl. It's probably not a, a, a prescription uh, pharmaceutical quality opioid. Those are actually very expensive. Uh, the, the street value of a, of a uh, oxycodone is about a dollar a milligram. So if you buy a 60 milligram pill on the street, it's going to be about 60 bucks. These are pennies per pill. And there's no way to know how much fentanyl is in each one of them. So it's, it's something where we need to start talking to our kids and the, the and the uh, public health department is starting to do that. I don't know, Carla, do you have that little card? Maybe you can... We don't. We only have one. Okay, we, we can pass it around. But, but so with, uh, we need to get the public health department to, to give more of these to us, so we can give them to you. But it has both. These are these are being passed out in high schools. It's, it says, "Don't be faked out." These are these are poison. There's a warning on it. On the backside, it says, "This is what an overdose looks like." A lot of people don't know what it looks like. And, and there's the common thought as well, he's just sleeping. We'll just let him sleep it off. Well, an overdose looks like somebody who's passed out drunk, but if you let him sleep it off, uh, their, their resp respiration could shut down entirely. So it, we need to talk honestly and authentically with our kids. It's more than just say no. It's this is what's out there. If somebody offers you this, it's probably this, and you don't know if it's going to kill you or not. We also have the reemergence re of methamphetamine uh, in our region for a while. Uh, all we were doing, we saw meth labs everywhere. Down here in the South King County was a popular place for people to cook their own methamphetamine. We did some things to cut down on the availability of the precursors. You know that when you go get a Sudafed tablets now, you have to sign for it. You feel like a criminal, right? You're like, this is terrible. But what it's done is it's shut down 
some of the commonly used uh, precursor chemicals that are needed to make this. So we've outsourced, we don't, which is a good thing that because when we encountered methamphetamine labs, it usually also ruined the entire house. There's so many caustic chemicals in there. We found people cooking them in, in a Winnebago's and they just had to be destroyed or even in a room in a motel and the whole motel had to replace all the, dry, the drywall and it, it was a terrible thing. But we've outsourced it to Mexico. It's now coming up here from Mexico in that same uh, stream that the fentanyl's coming in and, and, and cocaine and other things as well. Stimulant deaths are um, a leading cause of o overdose deaths in Washington. Mm -hmm. So we've had... But many people have seen the Seattle is dying thing. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of fear and resistance and anger and all of those emotions that we feel because we don't want this in our community. It wasn't this bad before, and we see now obvious distress. Uh, and the question is, what are we going to do about it? And I get a lot of a lot of pressure to like to, from people saying we need to put these people in prison. <coughs> And if you watch the entire Seattle is Dying show, at the end there was a shot of the McNeil Island Penitentiary, and it said, the voiceover said, well, maybe the answer is right here, or it's like we just put people on this penal colony in the middle of the sound and make us uncomfortable. Like, that's obviously not a real solution. The solution has to be, I think, to, to, to say that there aren't solutions, but there are strategies. Certainly putting people in prison is one strategy. It's a very expensive strategy, and it's not very effective. And as we know, and, and the only silver lining that I can see from the overdose epidemic that we're in the middle of is that most of us know somebody, a friend or a family member, or, or who have gone through substance use disorder. And, 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 we, and we know what we think might work for them. But we also have a lot of science. There's been a lot of studies about what works. I want to talk a little bit about, about that. First, I always recommend this book for people who are interested in the, the war on drugs. This is called Chasing the Scream uh, by a British journalist named Johan Hari, and it, it, it takes us through the entire uh, history of the United States uh, policies and strategies about drug addiction. Uh, but to me, the most important line was this, and this really rang true for me, that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. Because people who become addicted to drugs, they lose their way, and they, and, and, they, and they burn their bridges. And this happened in my family. My younger sister was a heroin addict, and for 15 years, she used heroin every single day. And I could no longer have a connection with her, because she would lie, and she would cheat, and she would steal. And I knew what she was doing, and she knew I was the prosecutor, and so she became isolated and surrounded herself with other people who had to seek drugs every day. And you know, if you're Heroin user, you need to use it about eight times, eight, I mean, about every eight hours, about three times a day. You need to shoot up, or else, you, or else you begin to go through what's been described to me as the most painful flu ever: nausea and 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 sweating, and, and and the withdrawal symptoms are something that people, once they go through it once, they never want to do it again. They'd rather they'd rather continue to use than to experience that. So those are that's where they are, and so connecting people back to positive things in their life. That's where these therapeutic communities like the Wolfen Academy is all about making that connection and about convincing people that they are worth saving. And that's the first thing you have to do with somebody who is in the throes of, of substance use disorder is to tell them that we love you and we, we see promise in you and, and you can be more than this and we want to help you get there. The National Institute on Drug Abuse defines addiction as a chronic relapsing brain disease characterized by compulsive drug seeking and use so the compulsive part, you think about it all the time, that's what you focused on, see, finding your drugs and using it despite harmful consequences. When I first read that, I thought, well, wait a minute, I'm in the, I'm in the harmful consequences business. We've been arresting people and prosecuting them and putting them in jail for having drugs on them. And, 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 and then it occurred to me, you know, if that worked, we would have solved this problem a long time ago because we've been doing this for years. We've been prosecuting thousands and thousands of people a year for drug crimes, and yet it didn't make them better. It didn't make them not want to use drugs. <coughs> so science tells us about addiction the, the following things. We'll go through these pretty quickly. First, drug exposure alone doesn't cause addiction. It's not a neurochemical hijacking of your brain just because you tasted a morphine molecule. We know that because if you've had a surgery and they send you home with a Costco-sized jug of oxycodone and you take one or two and you go, I don't really like that, and you put them back in the medicine cabinet, you shouldn't do. Uh, most of us have no problem putting them down because we don't like them. 
So it's something more than that. It's something more than just, I tasted it and now I'm addicted. Usually there's also some traumatic experiences that the person has as well. And they, and they learn, it's a learned behavior. So if you're, trying, if you're suffering pain in your life and then you, you try the drugs, you learn for at least a while that the drugs gave you the ability to, to dull that pain. They gave you for a while some power over the things that were painful in your life. And then they begin to take over your life. But if it's a learned, if it's a learning disorder, it can also be unlearned through various strategies. And the ones that I want to talk about are harm reduction and support today. Punishment cannot solve a problem defined by resistance to punishment. And like I say, if, if punishment worked, we would, we would not be where we are today. And all people learn better when treated with respect. I think we know that. And that's how we, that's how we would want to be treated. That we finally escaped the shame and stigma of our substance abuse issue and came forward and asked for help. Do we want handcuffs in a jail cell or do we want someone to tell us we believe in you and we think, you can, we, think we can work through this together? And finally, prevention programs should also focus on alternative ways to cope with stress and trauma. You know, the prevention, the Just, the just Say No prevention program, uh, I might have worked for some people, but we also know that people are going to feel stressed out. And how, we, how our children see us cope with stress and trauma is how they're going to learn to cope with stress and trauma. So we're always modeling that. So when mommy needs that glass of wine or daddy needs that beer, you're sending a message that I've had a hard day and this is how I'm going to cope with it. That's a strong and powerful message that, that children watch and emulate. And I want to talk a little bit about medication assisted treatment is particularly for opioid use disorder so it doesn't work for methamphetamine or stimulants or other addictions but for opioid disorder there are some medications which science is proving reduce the risk of mortality by 50 percent if you can get into one of these things your chance of dying from an overdose is reduced by half if you can get some of these behavioral uh, therapies and the big ones that we know the one that's been around for the longest is methadone uh, Methadone is highly regulated, uh, needs to be, for the most part, uh, in observed clinical doses. So there's a couple of methadone clinics in the county. People have to show up there every day and someone has to watch them take their little uh, dose of methadone. Uh, and, and, that's, and it works for some people. And it works to stabilize, it works to, to hold off the uh, withdrawal symptoms. Uh, and all of these have the adv advantage of not creating the kind of destabilizing euphoria that fentanyl or heroin will do, but they will keep you from getting sick and allow you to then focus on the other parts of your life that need, that need to be helped. The one that the county is uh, working on now as a, as a strategy is Suboxone, also known as buprenorphine. Suboxone is buprenorphine and naloxone, which is the, uh, the drug that keeps people from uh, reverses an overdose. The county strategy through the public health department is to make Suboxone as easy to get as heroin and to reduce all barriers to it. When we first started to, to introduce it, we required appointments, and the people who made appointments didn't show up, and the people who showed up didn't have appointments. And we thought, well, why, why are we doing this? If you've, if you've come to the clinic and you ask for help, we should be able to get you on Suboxone today. And so that's the strategy that we're, we're trying to uh, enforce. And then there's another drug called Vivitrol, which is an injection, it lasts for a month, costs about 1000 to $1,500 per shot, um, and it's, it's something that has, has some controversy within the therapeutic community as to whether or not that's uh, as effective as the others. But it's, it's out there. So there, you just need to know there are drugs that if, if somebody has an opioid use disorder, if we can get them onto those drugs, the benefits are they don't get sick from withdrawal and they're not so destabilized and, and euphoric that they can't focus on getting better. So the question that everybody should ask across the country is, well, what does happen to people who are drug users who get arrested. Because the war on drugs is a, it's a political symbol, right? It came through the, from the Nixon uh, times and it was, it's really been bandied around. And in all my time in the prosecutor's office and working with police, I've never heard anybody in the system say, oh, we're going to war, this is war on drugs. It's, that's not how the people who are in the system think about it. But the truth is that about 80% of the people who are arrested for a drug crime are drug users, are arrested for simple possession. And if you think about it, if you're a daily drug user, you wake up every day, you've got your drugs on you, you're a walking felony all day long, every day, because you've always got drugs on you. So it's just a matter of, 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 of statistics and 
consequence that you're going to at some point be found with those drugs. So what we found happened to, to the drug prosecutions in our, in our county, and let me say this, that 10 years ago, uh, faced with some significant budget cuts, I made the decision to take cases out of Superior Court that were drug possession cases and put them into District Court, which is our misdemeanor court. Uh, and, and it saved the county a significant amount of money based on the, the public defense costs and, and other things. And the Superior Court, while we have a successful drug court program in Superior Court, it is focused on people who are looking at many years in prison. And they, most people who succeed in drug court are there for burglaries, identity theft, other more serious crimes, and they're facing a lot of time. That's the incentive to go through the hard work of drug court. Drug possession, on the other hand, is the lowest level crime on the books. People were facing about a couple days in, in jail, and then they would be back out. So even even for a felony crime. So in the district court, this is what happens to about 800 cases a year. The, between 800 and 1,000 people were arrested every year for a tiny amount of drugs, like say under a gram. A gram would be a Splenda pack. A gram is what a, an M&M weighs, so not a peanut M&M, a plain, plain M&M. Uh, so typically what happens is it's nobody's priority. It takes almost a year to resolve these cases because it takes the police three to six months to send us the case. It's going to sit on a stack while we, while we charge today's robberies, rapes, and murders. We'll get to that eventually. And it takes almost a year to resolve it. The individual would end up spending 15 days in jail, not as punishment, but because there are warrants issued. They don't show up for jail. And, and, and to be honest, they probably didn't even know that we'd filed the case because when we file it, we send a summons, a letter to their last known address six months after they were arrested. So it's this chasing game where we, we, we have warrants. Go ahead and, and run this out. So 1.4 1. warrants per case. So that means a police officer has to serve that warrant. We have to book that person 1.4 times per case. And at the end of, at the, end of the time, <coughs> end of the year, they come and they plead guilty to a gross misdemeanor and there's no offer of help made at any point. So we're taking the people who are already the most vulnerable, marginalized people, who have what we all agree is a disease of substance use disorder, and we put them through this long path of due process. We can do better. If one of our strategies is going to continue to be we should put drug users in court and arrest them, then we should have some way that it, offer, it results in an offer of help and support. One of the things that we've developed over the last few years is uh, the LEAD program. You may have heard LEAD stands for Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. It gives the police an extra tool when they encounter somebody who has had a pathetic life, who is out on the streets, who has a needle in their arm or a little tiny little bit of drugs. Rather than putting them through that other process, they call for a case manager from the LEAD program. And then they begin to work with that person. They make that connection, which we think is the answer to helping getting people off the street. They make a connection, they offer them any sort of help that they need. Where are you living? You need a place to live, you need clean clothes, you need a cup of soup, we're just gonna help you just feel like a human being and feel like you're worth helping. We have found that in the LEAD, in the lead program, if you go back one second, uh, it has been studied. People who are in the LEAD program, they don't stop getting arrested, but they're 60% less likely to get arrested. They spend less time in jail, they're much less likely to go to prison, and it actually saves yeah. us money. Turns out, if you want to help people, it's actually cheaper than if you want to prosecute them and incarcerate them. And this has been replicated throughout the, uh, the country. And we're in Burien, and I'd love to come to Kent. Uh, we found $3 million last year to begin an expansion in Burien, and, and they're very excited to have this additional option. It relies on the police to make the call who gets this help and who doesn't. How much time do we got? I'm past my time. Okay, we're just going to say this that. There's a lot, this is something that's not going away. Uh, we, have, we have a lot to learn from science and from our experience. Uh, and, in, and the ultimate answer is in the community. If this community wanted to step up and fund more of the kinds of programs like the one that in this building, uh, and we had more capacity to help people when we bring the LEAD program here, I think we're gonna have to do 50 things to manage this. Uh, and the one that I'm gonna keep pushing back on is we should reserve that prison cell for the person who is the violent drug dealer, the for-profit drug dealer, the import, importer of fentanyl, and if someone has a drug addiction, we should treat it like a disease and treat them like they're a member of our family. So, sorry to go over, I got excited. Yeah. But thank you for your attention, appreciate it. Thank you very much. We have a few questions, I'm gonna to try to moderate this as best I can. There's a lot of cards here.
Um, so one, we are a business community here. And one of the reason that we invited you was because a few months back, late last year, we invited the chief of PDA to speak to the organization about um, crime that's happening here and what's going on. And so that brought the question of, um, oftentimes we, we have many business owners here who will call the police, they will arrest someone, it won't be the first time, the second or the third time. And so we have been uh, communicated that there's a certain degree as to what your office decides to prosecute. Can you speak to how um, repeat offenders, they might be property crimes, they might be low level crimes, but at what level is prosecution really gonna occur? Okay, so we start with the, the jurisdictional lesson that, that misdemeanors that happen in the city of Kent go to the Kent City Attorney's Office. Felonies will come to our office uh, here at the Regional Justice Center. And we prosecute everything from the, the violent crimes, the domestic violence crimes, and the sexual assaults, burglaries, car thefts, uh, down to thefts that are of a felony level. A shoplift is not a felony level unless you, somebody gets punched and it becomes a robbery. So we you have, say if I punch him or he punches me. Are well, you the robber or are you the sheriff? I'm the good person. Oh, of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. No, if, if, the, if the person who's stealing the item uses force to effect the taking, then that becomes a robbery, not just a shoplift. So there, there are, it, it depend, depends on which, which crime we're talking about. But there, there is a line at which it's a misdemeanor and there's a line at which it's a felony. So, so I'll, give you, I'll give you the overall. So um, I believe it was out of the South King County area, won't well, name the city, but there was a person who was trying to carjack, was trying to, it was robbed a person through a drive through window. Uh, the police, like, they, they still, then steal a car. Uh, he's get him on a chase. They, they hit a police car, they block him in, but he's fighting during the arrest. And at the end of the day, uh, he was only charged for, stolen, for stealing a car. So he wasn't charged with assaulting a police officer. He wasn't charged with all these other felonies. It was kind of brought down to one charge. And so it's, you know, you have these things of that nature that, yeah, I, I, I can't really I know, that's respond just one to example, a, but that's to, to a hypothetical like that. But no, it was an actual one. Yeah, but I mean, I don't know. I don't know why. I, I, I can tell you that we have we have a bunch of hardworking, dedicated prosecutors over here who are who are not looking to give a break to somebody, but we're looking at the evidence and what can we prove, uh, and we will file the most serious charge that we can file, uh, and then begin the process of, of, of adjudicating that case. So we don't file every case that we can think of. So, so all right. there's two ways to charge. You can charge everything you can think of. Make a law school exam. I'm charge ten different things, and then for a plea, I'm going to reduce. I'm going to dismiss nine of them. That's what some places do. We instead will file the most serious charge that we can prove. And if you don't plead to it immediately, then we're going to re reserve the right to add. So by the time we get to trial, we may add other charges. It's more of a conservative approach, but we get to the same place. Uh, with a di in, in every system has a disincentive to go to trial. We can't have 100% of our cases go to trial. I think our trial rate is about 4% in the felony field, so we have to find a way to, to negotiate the other 90 plus percent. The other question is, is the Criminian program implemented in any of the state prisons? I don't know what What's that, that is. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is either. I thought it was a good question. Criminian from Crimea? I don't know what that is. So okay, so we tried. I tried. Um, um, what how has the um, how has the legalization of, of marijuana changed what you're what, what you're seeing now? So the legalization of marijuana in which is actually I always say it's the regulation because people you can't grow it, mm -hmm. you can't sell it, you don't have a license. Uh, so we still see those kinds of things. Uh, we also have seen in South King County, particularly some uh, homes that were purchased with foreign money, mostly from China. Those homes were turned over into massive grow farms. Uh, and that, that weed was then not sent here because our, our store prices, I understand, are, are competitive with the black market, but it's sent back east. It's sent back to, to the east coast where they can get a whole bunch more money for it. So we have had dozens of those homes have been discovered by police. There are a tremendous amount of work to kind of clean up. They forfeited the properties. So there's still black market here, but it's not being sold here. Overall, we're spending a lot less time arresting and prosecuting people who are users of cannabis. Uh, but it's not without some crime as well. There have been stores that have been burglarized and there have been robberies in, in cannabis stores. And so there's always cash and, and, and drugs there. So it's an attractive place for that. So there's still some security issues. Overall, I'd rather deal with that than with the black market. We had a much bigger black market before. And now it's confined to these grow farms that are that don't sell locally. That, but instead of export. export. Yeah. Another export of Washington, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so this is, data has reported that a large percentage of the prison population is dealing with mental health challenges. Um, what 
how, what we need to do, what can we do better to facilitate and address those mental health issues from incarceration, um, incarceration. So research shows particularly in the women's prison, and I mean, Carla and I have been to the Purdy and to Mission Creek where women are, 95% of the women there have been victims of sexual assault and or domestic violence. They have tremendous trauma going way back to the childhood neglect. So uh, one of the things that we need to insist, as I mentioned, like what is the purpose of punishment? We should discuss that. Our legislature should be carrying out what we think the purpose of punishment should be. It has to be to be help people through that trauma. They can, we can't expect them to come back and be uh, fully productive citizens if they've never dealt with the issues that cause them to, to get there. I don't think today that we do a good enough job. I think we need to invest a lot more into that, and particularly in the women's prisons. Mm -hmm. The other thing is education in prison. Uh, it still re remains uh, against state law to spend public money on higher education in prison. That's one of these laws that makes no sense at all. Came back from, from the 90s, they took they took that away because they, the, the criminological philosophy back then was if we make prisons really bleak and nasty, nobody's gonna wanna go there. Didn't turn out to really be a deterrent, I think, and I have never seen any laws actually deter people because the people that we see who come into our office having committed serious felony crimes are doing it impulsively or doing it because they have a significant behavioral health issue. They don't think they're gonna get caught. And the last thing they think about is, what's the prosecutor gonna do to me? Well, I saw Scare Straight in junior high and I was good, so. But there were no prosecutors in there. They were the only other inmates in that. I, I was scared. <laughs> you, you weren't going there. Right? I wasn't, well, you, know, you know, you never know. Uh, the difference between me and uh, a senator, you know, who knows? What's the difference? So um, some of us, have, as you mentioned, we have family who have dealt with drugs in our family. Um, when there's a family member who's um, in that situation and they, the family may have said, you know, please incarcerate my, my youth or my young adult or my family member because they're creating harm and they're put back into, they're, not, they're, not, they're put back on the street. What can a family really do so that they, if, if you're not, if you want them to, you know, deal with the community, we want them to get help. What can we do? Sorry, how, how old is the child? We'll make them 20 years old. Okay. Yeah. So they're adults. They're adults. <laughs> they're not past deductible. So no. if yeah, if they're if they're if they're adults, then uh, you know <coughs> there are not enough ways to access treatment in our community. I'll just say that we need more places like this. We need more uh, places like Valley Cities has has, a, has some programs there. There is a new law. That uh, called Ricky's Law that that <coughs> suggests that we can use the involuntary treatment process to get somebody help for substance use disorder. The jury's still out on whether that is effective or not, and we hadn't had any beds until recently. And I'm not sure if they're open yet. Mike, do you know? Yeah. Are they open now? Yeah, they're open. And it's just like 16 bed facility. Yeah. So we'd have to go through a legal process to to force somebody against their will to go into treatment. I don't know if coerced treatment. Uh, scientifically works or not, but at least they're not going to die. Then I mean, and, and people are desperate. I mean, I was there. I mean, families believe that their their their, their child is going to kill themselves through drugs and want some sort of help. <coughs> don't think that we have enough of that. We don't. And we need to invest in it as a community. It needs to be a priority for funding. There is a there's an idea that's being floated around that has support from the business community right now, which is a would be a tax in King County on businesses that on every employee that makes more than $150,000, it wouldn't be a tax on the employee, it'd be a tax on the business of about 0 0.02. So if you have an employee that makes $150,000, you're gonna spend about $300 on this tax. Overall, and like I said, this is supported by the business community because they've invested a lot in, the, in, in our region and they realize there's not enough support, there's not enough treatment, there's not enough homeless support. And, and so we need to do something. And so that would raise $130 million a year that might help us to build more of these facilities, to have more places that, that families can, can get somebody into. But ultimately, I don't think you can force somebody to get into treatment, um, but that's certainly something that um, research is looking into. I'll take this time. Thank you for coming. Thank that's you. our last question. But on, 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 in regards to that note, um, I can say that the Kent Chamber of Commerce, the South Sound Chamber of Commerce are in, in opposition to that bill. Um, the city is also in opposition to that bill as it's come out because we want more information as to the exemptions and how that pulls out. So, um, yes, while some businesses are uh, in favor, not all businesses are standing in support of that. So we want to take the time to thank, um, thank you, Mr. Satterberg for coming today. And I'm going to turn it over to...